So welcome to another edition of Insight History. Today we're going to examine what really is the role of a museum in a community. Certainly you could think that they're stewards of our history, of our heritage, and they're there to creatively engage and educate the citizens in the community and preserving the fabric of the soul of the community. So it's interesting to note that nationwide over the past few years, attendance at museums has actually gone down. However, Ketchikan's museum serves as a bright shining example of attendance growth and we're here today to show you exactly why. Come with us as we explore the enriching programs that the Ketchikan Museum offers to our great community. How many people actually use the museum each year? Well use is a really interesting term because we have visitors and we have people who are doing research and people who are coming for programs. Uh, grand total uh, we get about about 55,000 people between the two museums each year. Wow. Most of that's in the summer mm -hmm. during our cruise ship season. Uh, but all of our programming, special programs, research, those sorts of things primarily take place in the off season and are with the local community. Do you see a particular demographic that uses um, the museum or is it this huge it's variety? Every, it's everyone. It really, really is. I mean, just based on numbers, again, the cruise ship passenger community far outweighs the local community as it would because it's, you know, almost a million people. But I mean, we have, in terms of researchers, we have, you know, personal family researchers, people who just want to know, hey, my grandfather lived here in the 1920s. Do you have any information on him? To more scholarly and academic things, to really large projects, to government projects as well, like uh, State Department of Transportation. Uh, city of Ketchikan, the borough, when they do large uh, capital projects, they often come to us and need information before they tear up a road or take a building down, those sorts of things. But it is open year round. We are open year round, absolutely. Our hours shift a little bit in the winter, but we are open year round. I wouldn't say I know a lot about the collections. I've spent a fair amount of time in here, though primarily going over things like old newspaper articles and, and things they may have had. Um, and I was fairly good friends with Richard Van Cleve, and I used to come over here, of course, my wife worked just down the hall, so I'd, usually when I'd stop in to see her, he'd say, hey, check this out! And, and, and my wife would get mad because she would be going, well, okay, you know, you're supposed to come here and talk to me. Well, yeah, but, but check out the same Richard's got here. Look, <laughs> look, look at this cedar basket that someone was using as a popcorn bowl. <laughs> yeah. Or check this out, or, or someone brought in this, or, or he'd frequently call, email me and say, check out, you know, what's this, you know, here's a photograph that came in, what, what do you know about it? And I'd maybe both look at it and try to figure out, you know, sort, sort of like history detectives really try to go, well, based on that car, because it could be 1936, but then cars in Kitchkin are always 10 years out of date, so it could be, you know, <laughs> could actually true. be 46. That's or, true. You know. That's yeah. true. Well, the, the collection space, uh, since the library has relocated, uh, it seems to have expanded uh, in, in a way that is more manageable. You've got more stuff on site. You know, the, I, I'm assuming that most of the stuff now is not over. I mean, at one point there were like three or four different locations in town where everything was. And I know that frequently if staff wanted, you'd, you'd email and say, hey, I need, I need X, and they'd say, oh, well, I have to go over, that's, that's over at blah, blah, blah. So it, it's a lot better for public access now because uh, my sense is more of it's here, you can, you can find it a lot more readily available. And as what often happens with museum archives, people just sort of come in off the street and go, hey, I need blah, 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 and you kind of sort of say, well, okay, we don't have that here, and it would be a pain to try to find it. Right, exactly. Now it's most of it's here. So it's organization that's really on, a, you know, on the verge of exploding. Excellent. Yeah. Do you guys all see, running around the room, do you see a rainbow <laughs> line that goes all oh, the way around? Yeah. Do you guys see numbers on it? Yeah. And those numbers look like years, correct? Yeah. Yes. This is a line that extends from the past all the way to the present. And what it does is it puts things that happen in Ketchikan in order. So you can understand how things, one thing might have led to another and how th why things look the way they do today. So your guide here in the summertime. Yes. One million visitors as of 1998. And a lot more since then. <laughs> exactly. What, what, what kind of expressions do you see on people's faces, locals and, and tourists alike? People often come in and they look up at these totem poles and they say, oh, wow. I mean, literally, we have people, uh, you know, 10 times a day go, oh, wow, that's their, that's their face right there. And when, and when you're kind of guiding them through this wonderful facility, um, you know, 
you've got to feel you're I mean you're a teacher you're a professor what's what's that wisdom piece that they're kind of walking away with like the biggest takeaway well that the, they the, the biggest takeaway is this was an incredibly complicated culture incredibly uh, wonderful civilization that existed here in Southeast Alaska and I don't think people realize how intense it was how beautiful it was in it. and I think that's one of the things that we like to tell people here there's a lot of information, misinformation people have about totem poles. We also like to correct that. So people come in and they get something that's accurate and, and in so context. Landmark and catch a can. Yes. And um, when they built the building, uh, it was a little bit of tourism involved, but it was also a, a classroom and a, a vehicle to have people that were my age that. Uh, were discouraged from native artwork and the language and to get it moving again and other people uh, younger than myself and it was a little strange because uh, forever the turn of the century uh, the missionaries and whatnot discouraged the art form other than some basketry and stuff that was something that was useful. But uh, totems and whatnot kind of went away. Really? And so um, they brought in a lot of these totems that were still, uh, had some face to them, so to speak, that they were not completely decayed and wanted the people to observe them locally and far and wide. And so some of them are here in the Totem Heritage Center, some are downstairs, and many of them that were too far gone to put out again, and uh, they restored them for uh, tourism, but they also did the replicas. community is growing. We've got big things happening around town. New people come every year, it seems like. Um, what would you tell them about Catch Camp's history? What would be your favorite thing to tell them, like a story maybe? I don't, I don't have a favorite story, because they're all great. I mean, it's been a fun place. And now it's changing in a way that's dynamic and reminds me of the 70s, because it was just, just a rocking town then. Um, what you have to understand about Ketchikan is that it changes all the time. Nothing is static in this town. It is, it is based on change. We were a mining town, well, when, when Western explorers came here mm -hmm. and, and, and when uh, Western people came here. I'm not speaking of the native culture because that is eternal. It was mining that brought it, then fishing, then timber, then tourism, then a big government influence. And now we have small businesses cropping up by young entrepreneurs that is just making this town very, very. So I know why you're hit, you're fascinated in history. I know I'm fascinated with history, but why all these other people? I, I wonder. I think it comes down to, to catch again. There are, I guess we shouldn't call old timers old timers anymore. I'm getting to that age. Yes, um, there's catch again has such a unique history. The, I mean, you go from the early days when there was a just a frontier town to that transition into a major area full of bootleg alcohol and characters <laughs> ladies of the night or day or red and all of these things and they're that naughty past has been part <laughs> that of naughty the, past. The, the intriguing thing you know we it's you know, look at some of the people that you would think were just scumbags, right? Um, uh, Black Matt Berkovich. You brought something today that is super cool. Can you share it? I can share it. Because there's a backstory to it. There is a backstory to it. Well, one of my thoughts on the museum is that uh, you should reflect back to why we're here. And uh, everybody has a different story to tell why why they arrived in Alaska, why they arrived in Ketchikan. Uh, it probably stems from childhood, a lot of us. So my father was born in Anchorage in 1924. Uh, nine years before that, Anchorage was just a tent city. And my, on my mother's side, uh, 
they were here during the, uh, the gold rush. And it's the, the reason I found that out as a, as a young man, uh, when my grandmother passed away, the inheritance was just a piece of paper, a deed signed by Benjamin Harrison. And in that packet was a picture from the Alaska Sportsman, which was published in Ketchikan, mm -hmm. Emory Tobin, in the Yates Building. That's where that uh, magazine originated from. <clears throat> so uh, I researched that to find that photo. And the unique part about it in this photo was my great-grandfather. And I have a, a copy of it, which I had enlarged. And instead of uh, having the typical dog sled team, <laughs> That's so neat. They had a team of uh, Angora goats, <laughs> and it was the only one like it on the, you know, during, during the gold rush. What did this fascination with Ketchikan history for you? Well, um, my family came here over 100 years ago. Uh, my great-grandfather was here as a miner in the 1890s. Um, and history has always been important. I, I, I'm not sure why, because often I get this when we're talking about questions like budget and why we fund things. People always say, "Well, why are we paying for paying for you know libraries and museums?" And I always think, "Well, why wouldn't we?" You know, that's so much about what Ketchikan is a part of. And 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 the, the reality of the, the uh, you know the, the museum is the community. It's, it's the repository of information. It's where you can go find our history. It's, stuff that, that we don't have space for, so that we, don't, we can't even conserve or keep. Um, and I'm always kind of fascinated when people say, well, why would you pay for that? Why, why is that important? Why do we need that? You know, we need roads, we need police, we need whatever. But why do we need a museum? Well, if you don't have a museum, what are you saying about yourself as a community? Particularly a town like Ketchikan that could truly have disappeared about five different times in its history. We could be a ghost town, like Hadley or some of the other towns around here, or even like Loring. We've reinvented ourselves every 20 or 30 years, whether it was mining, fishing, timber, now tourism. But part of that is also keeping that community knowledge alive. There are not that many people in this town. I mean, and the folks that live here or have lived here for a while go back a long ways. When a town's 120 years old and your grandparents were here, they were here at the early days. I mean, the really early days <laughs> of Ketchikan. So everyone, not everyone, but lots of people have ties with people in the community that go back to the very beginnings of this town. So it's not just a history. It's it's like your own family tales. You exactly. Kind of, it's exciting to see what's happened. It's interesting to know the interrelationships. Um,